Hello. Welcome to the third installment in my project to make my own DCC decoders for some of my N-gauge locomotives. In the previous video, I got an AT Tiny 85 microcontroller to decode the DCC signal from the track and control some LEDs in response to certain DCC commands. There are various improvements I've thought about and dabbled with on the programming side, which I intend to cover in a different video, but most of my attention has gone into making what I've got so far small enough to fit inside a locomotive. One good step was a simplification in the number of components needed in the first place. I had previously come across articles describing the use of voltage dividers or optocouplers to reduce the track's high voltage for an input to the microcontroller, which required several components. It was suggested to me that doing it the other way around, having the track's low voltage pull an input to a low logic level, just needed a diode and a 10k resistor. I made that adjustment on my breadboard and it worked. I didn't even need to change any of my code on the microcontroller. The driving cars of my Voyagers are my first target use of homemade decoders. These models have 6-pin DCC decoder sockets and only the lights need to be controlled, so it's as simple as it gets. Step 1 was to find suitable pins to fit the socket in the model. The NMRA have specifications for physical decoder interfaces. For the 6-pin socket, the pins have to have a gap of 1.27mm between them, and the pins themselves need to have a diameter of 0.2mm. I found it difficult to find anything with both of these dimensions, whether I searched in Imperial or Metric, so eventually just plumped for something that said it was 1.27mm pitch. Looking at a close-up product image, I could compare the gap between the pins to their width, and the proportions looked right. Once they arrived, I was pleased to find they did fit, though it's quite tight. I tried some from both CPC Fanel and Amazon, and I've put links in the description to what I bought. I don't know why, but previously I thought I could only configure the 80 Tiny 85 to run as fast as 8 MHz without any extra components, but it's actually 16 MHz so long as it has a high enough voltage supply. After some issues where my 80 Tiny seemed to stop responding to DCC commands, I decided to try it at 16 MHz, and then it worked again. A faster clock speed gives it a much better chance at correctly detecting the DCC signal and also getting other things done. These issues were during a summer heatwave, so it's likely to have been running slower than before. For the higher power, I switched to a 5V voltage regulator. This is still well below the minimum 8.5V that the DCC systems are required to supply to the track for N-gauge, so there should always be enough power. Ultimately, I want to try making my own printed circuit boards, so I've bought what I think are the necessary bits and pieces to do that, but as an easier step in that direction I've started with surface mount components on perfboard. I bought all the surface mount versions of the components I'd used so far. In many cases I could choose from quite a few different package sizes, so I bought some that were very small for when I get to using printed boards, and some that I thought would be the right size to fit across two holes in the perfboard. Because I haven't yet finished the programming side of things for the AT Tiny, I decided to use the DIP packaged version with a separate DIP8 socket on the perfboard. It means I can easily remove the AT Tiny to reprogram it, and the pins all line up with the holes on the perfboard. I've got several small perfboards from a while ago, so after loosely arranging components, I cut one to a size that would fit easily into the Voyager, but have enough room for the components. To start with, I tried scoring the board and then snapping it, but that didn't work. I had to saw through it. The hacksaw I've got has a warped blade, so the cut wasn't great, but it was good enough to do the job. A saw blade in good condition and a thinner perf board would be preferable. Over a few weeks I occasionally added components and connected them on the underside of the board using offcuts of wires from resistors. The surface mount capacitors aren't polarity sensitive, unlike the large ones I've used before, and resistors can go either way around. The voltage rectifier has clear labels on it, and the voltage regulator's datasheet is clear about which terminal is for what purpose. As I added components, I tested connections using a multimeter's continuity mode. The diode has some markings that are just about visible, but its datasheet doesn't mention them. I thought the continuity tester, or diode tester mode, of my multimeter would be ideal for this, but it didn't beep either way around. The value it showed did change, but I didn't know what to make of that, so I used the battery and LED with the diode to see which way it worked. The easiest way to make this board connect into the socket in the Voyager was to solder some ribbon wires to it, and solder those to some pins. Only four of the pins are needed, the two tracks and the red and white lights. Eventually I had enough done to provide power to the AT-Tiny85 and to detect the DCC signal, 
so I decided to make connections to external LEDs for testing, for which I attached some temporary wires. To start with, it didn't work. It turned out to be because I used the wrong pin on the underside of the board for the DCC signal input, so I had to desolder that connection. To reach the correct pin, this wire had to cross over another one, so I used a short bit of normal insulated multicore wire from my offcuts for that. Happily, that was my only mistake, and the board was able to correctly control the LEDs in response to DCC commands from my controller. This is as far as I've got with the circuit board building, but I'm pleased with how it's going and have so far found it quite straightforward to solder components to the perf board, though I've had to think hard when flipping the board upside down about which hole goes to which component. The next stage will be to control the lights in the Voyager. For a while I hadn't given specific thought to how lights are actually controlled by a decoder, I've just been powering some test LEDs directly from the AT Tiny. The NMRA decoder interface specifications state which pins are used for front and rear locomotive lights, but I couldn't find anything more specific than that in any of the NMRA standards documents. I found some other information from general searches online, but they typically just return forum posts or independent articles, such as one from DCC Concepts. Since it's possible to use different brands and ranges of decoders with different brands and ranges of locomotives, I feel there must be a common standard somewhere, but I can't find it. If you know of one, then please do let me know, it would be very useful. If you've watched many of my videos, or those from Ian's Engage, you'll know it goes without saying that DAPOL don't typically provide much detail in their manuals, so my only option was to do some reverse engineering. I opened a Voyager driving car and experimented with the 3 volt battery and some leads. Connecting power to the DCC socket didn't have any effect, but connecting to the socket used for the lighting cable, I found the lights in the vehicle have a common positive. To see the underside of the circuit board, I had to unscrew it, along with two of the pickup connections and a weight, and disconnected the lights to make things easier. Analyzing it was difficult. The whole thing seems to be painted black, so it can be hard to see where the power lines are, but they're slightly raised from the surface, so it can be seen when angled against daylight. The board is double-sided, which I suspect is very common, but that adds to the trickiness in working out which bits connect to other bits. The NMRI specifications dictate which pins are for which purpose, and some spaces on the board are labelled R1, R2, C1 and C2. It seems likely those are resistors and capacitors. There was another component, Q1, that had a label on its packaging, KL3, and after some searching for that online, I think it's a voltage rectifier. That would make sense for its location, because both track power feeds seem to go into it and then onto the common for the lights. For more of this, I could see the rectified track power goes directly to the three pin connector for the lights, then each of the other pins, labelled R for red and W for white, goes to a resistor and then to its terminal in the decoder socket. This PCB has solder pads for M plus and M minus, which must be for the motor, even though there isn't a motor in these driving cars, so presumably the same type of PCB is used in the motorised vehicle. These lights and PCB have to work on DC power too so I can infer this circuit is safe with 12 volts, which I think is the maximum DC power an analog controller will supply. DAPOL instructions do say these driving cars can't be used on DCC track with their DCC blanking chips in place, because it will damage the LEDs. The blanking chip directly connects track pins to lighting pins, so with my gauge master system that would result in 13 volts going through the circuit. So what should a decoder do? Well it can't supply any positive current to the lights because that already comes from the track, so it needs to complete the LED circuit back to the track but with some extra resistance to avoid too much current going through the LEDs. I think I can achieve that by getting the AT Tiny to control transistors which connect the LEDs to the negative terminal of my voltage rectifier. That will be the next thing I try to do, and will probably require another small section of perf board. This project is taking a long time to progress, but it is moving along, and at the moment it's what I'm finding most interesting with my model railway. July and August were also busy months with other events taking my time, but things should calm down now, so hopefully I can spend more time on this sooner rather than later. That's all for now. Bye bye!